It's day two at Winfarthing in Norfolk, where Helen has brought the team together to investigate the site of a grave of the 7th century Anglo-Saxon woman. It was discovered by Tom Lucking in 2015, buried with some stunning finds. This is the massive gold pendant. I know, it's absolutely extraordinary. It's incredible. It's exquisite. Jackie's analysis of the bones tells us that she lived a long and healthy life and even gives us a glimpse into what she may have looked like. A lovely little, little feminine square chin at the front, tiny square chin, very like yours, actually. Yeah. Our excavations have uncovered at least one other grave, so we could be looking at an Anglo-Saxon cemetery. A head would come up to here. Yeah. So if all we've got is that, then yeah. we're going to have lost I mean, this doesn't an feel... awful lot. It seems the side of this important burial is gradually being ploughed away. So every new find is incredibly important. Oh, gosh, we're looking at a set I want to burst into tears. <laughs> It's the beginning of the day, and in Trench One, Matt and Tom are opening up a bigger area in search of traces of the grave of our windfarthing woman. Right, yeah. this is it. Fingers crossed. All of them. But there's still no sign of the 2015 excavation, the grave, or a ring ditch. Yeah, nope. Nope. Definitely not there. It's interesting that she's not. There's actually not much. I mean, we know we're in the right ballpark, but there's yeah. obviously not much else going on around what? her. Further down the slope in Trench 2, the overnight watering is helping Jackie and Hilda make out the grave cut of the burial they found yesterday. You can really see the colours as well and, and the edges or what remains of the edges a lot better now. We're right at the bottom of the grave, yeah. so it looks really narrow because we're right at the bottom and it's so shallow, but it has made it stand out. And I think, obviously, the skull's going to have gone, but all we can do is investigate and see what's surviving there and what we can tell from it delicate operation. Mm. And there's no it's point leaving it in situ because it'll just get destroyed. It's and so shiny. I mean, look, it's right on the interface between the plough soil and the natural. I mean, this would be gone in another couple of years completely yeah. with the ploughing of it, so... So, Helen, John, I see you've got a digger ready. So what's the plan for today? Well, the plan for today is to treat this field like any other field and just have the question, what is in this field, and apply a standard technique. I mean, up until now, we've been led by work that's been done in the past. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is investigate our geophysics now. We've got this clear ditch, which we think is sort of shown on the early maps, isn't mm -hmm. it? And at this point here, there might just be the hints of a square feature. So we thought a trench that takes in that response and goes over the ditch as well. If it is a square feature, it would be very interesting from a, a Saxon cemetery point of view. Certainly. But it is a long shot. Right, so we should have two intercutting ditches here. So Matt moves his attention to Trench 3 to see whether the square feature in the geophys or the ditch had anything to do with the Anglo-Saxon cemetery. OK. Yeah, lovely. Stuart's been scouring the landscape for an Anglo-Saxon open-air parliament, which confusingly is called a thing or a ting in Old English. Sam Newton believes that this ting could be the key to our story. Stuart's begun his survey in the village of Shelfanger and has spotted a significant field name on the maps. This little strip of field alongside this hedge line, this parish boundary, is called Pilgrim Meadow, which is a very, very interesting name. Is that a legacy of some memory of people visiting this place for burial? Uh, long lost in folklore, but to retain a name like that in this landscape, where most of the field names are just descriptions of the sizes of the fields, like four acre or six acre field, actually raises the possibility that this has been a historic routeway of some form or another in an early landscape. And as he walks down to the stream, he's getting a very different perspective on the landscape. I'm almost totally enclosed. I'm in a hollow in the landscape. I can't see out to the east. I can't see out to the west. To the north, the landscape rises again. 
so I'm at the feeling I'm within sort of a large bowl in the landscape. He's following the course of the river along the streamline past our site. What's interesting when you get down to the stream and looking up towards the head of the valley is how it does look as if you're heading into a almost like an alcove in the landscape and the further you walk into that alcove the narrower this this valley actually becomes and the further I walk in reality the higher the burial appears up on the the slope up to my right. He's making his way to Wind Farthing itself where they've got a good number of test pits underway to look for Anglo-Saxon activity near the church. So would you lay the charcoal? So that's the only bit that seems a bit odd. <laughs> oh, what have we got here? Looks like pottery, doesn't it? And as the archaeology and the finds get more interesting, there's a competitive edge emerging. I think we're all coming. We're all listening out to see what anybody else finds. Is there a competition between Is there competition? Are we, are we, are we, are we I felt a little bit of competition when I found out that their hole was deeper than ours. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> it makes you, makes you sort of like um, swing that mattock a bit. <laughs> A bit so harder. You know so with, with the pit so far, which has the, uh, the most interesting find. Oh. Uh, so, we're, um, so what is the most we're, interesting we're, find? We're very excited at that. It's uh, with, with, I think, late Anglo-Saxon fragments. And one of our volunteers has experience of Anglo-Saxon finds. In fact, he dug with Basil Brown, the man who found the graves at Sutton Hoo. I knew Basil for about 25 years. A very genteel man, mm. full of knowledge. Yeah, he said, uh, what you must do is keep your edges straight on a section. So this is what I do. <laughs> Back on site in Trench 3, Matt thinks the square feature on the geophys was just geology, but the ditch is looking more promising. Well, I would say, Lindsay, we've got the, the, the ditch here. Yeah, we? nice clear ditch coming through. Yeah. So should we could we a bit clear of the edges? Kind of along there. Your that side looks a bit straighter, doesn't it? But it's, it's pretty good. Chalky stuff. Our oh, flipping neck is rock solid. <laughs> <laughs> so hard Do you need a it. If we want to get into if it, if it is medieval and there's medieval stuff in it, it's gonna be Right at the base. I guess, yeah, right at the base and where the, where it's silted up yep. and then this so this upper stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of uh, yeah, fairly recent. As part of our investigations, we're creating a virtual museum. In it, we're collecting finds that help to tell the story of the wind-farthing woman. And I'm curious to find out what the purpose was for the chatelaine rings that ran from her waist to her knee. That was them in close-up, and they weren't linked together. They were all separate, and they're decorated on both faces with these stamped circles, which is quite a common stamp shape. And, and are they purely decorative or do they have any purpose? Um, well, I'm always reluctant to say anything is purely decorative. <laughs> um, you know, they may well have had some kind of symbolic uh, meaning. The fact that they sometimes have keys or, or kind of symbolic keys attached to them, so they may be meant to reflect something about the special role of the woman in the household. Well, who can say? And they can have practical things. I mean, our woman has got a knife at her waist, but sometimes there's a knife on the end of this. Mm. And so you can imagine that's quite handy. You, you hold your knife's on a chain kind mm -hmm. of thing. You can never lose it. And carrying on with the symbolism theme, um, we're moving up to her neck, she's got, in addition to the great big pendant, she's got this little short choker necklace as well. And two of the pendants are made out of Frankish coins. Ooh. So, so who's depicted on the coin? Well, the coin is struck by Sigebert III. So, Helena, is, is this the, the royal head of Sigebert III? <laughs> well, we assume that this is meant to evoke the king of the Franks, but of course it looks terribly Roman in a way, doesn't it? He's yeah. wearing a, a diadem, he's got something around his neck. So I think he's meant to look quite Roman, but I think we are meant to understand that he is, in fact, the king of the Franks and the person under whom this coin was, was struck. Mm, and it's been converted into a pendant by the addition of this loop held on by a gold rivet. And, and what's on the reverse side? 
Let's turn it over. This is really interesting, isn't it, Helena? Because yeah. it, it's got a cross. Now, I think if, if we had just come across that cold, we might have wondered if the cross was shown to indicate one thing or the head was shown. <laughs> it's on both sides. It's, it, as excavated, it was the, the head facing out, yeah. not the cross. Yeah. The last thing in the middle of this little choker necklace is this rather marvellous yeah. gold pendant. And I think something that you'll like, Helena, on the back, if I can turn it over and move it round a bit so you can really see there's a repair patch just there. Yeah, yeah. yeah you can see that very clearly. Yeah. Well, that is really interesting um, because in quite a lot of these rich 7th century female graves, you have got very posh jewellery that's been broken, sometimes it's been repaired, sometimes it's not been repaired, um, but it was clearly relatively old and well-loved and well-worn at the point at which it was buried. And, and you wonder whether actually the importance of these objects was actually enhanced by the fact that it was old mm. and had been around for a while, maybe passed through several generations. Who knows? The finds were clearly well used precious and suggest an international influence as well as pagan and Christian iconography. Derek and Lawrence are going to see what else the grave goods can tell us using X-ray fluorescence, because their chemical makeup should reveal information that is invisible to the naked eye. It's possible that the striking similarities of Our Lady's pendant with jewellery from Sutton Hoo could indicate wind farthing benefited from royal patronage. The quality of the gold might help to confirm this theory. And whether the bowl was made of bronze or brass could tell us if it was made in the Byzantine world or in East Anglia. The bottom of the bowl fell apart on excavation, but fragments were preserved along with the soil from inside it. So Naomi has been sifting through the contents to see what she could find. So right now it's a little bit confusing, a bit intriguing. And in amongst the green yeah, metal of the bowl itself, so she found some organic material. So yeah, I'm not sure what this, this woody material is. It's a bit confusing. It could have been sort of a, a lining or even the bowl could have been sat inside this wooden thing. Really not sure. I've never seen anything like this. Um, so yeah, more and more intrigue. But this is why a lot of stuff happens in post-excavation. That's when you get your answers. It's painstaking work. But knowing the contents of this unusual bowl could unlock so much about our wind-farthing woman. Back in the trenches, we're confident that there's more than one burial in Trench 2. So I've got the burial in the middle, but you've just found this other possible feature running in the same alignment. Yeah, um, the top of the grave cut seems to be aligned with the top of that one there. Uh, I started cleaning this back to about here, and then I noticed that there was a, uh, a sort of shadow, and I thought it was the sun, but then the sun's gone in now, and um, yeah, it's definitely really well defined. And um, yeah, I'm just going to just clean it back a bit more and uh, see where we go. It definitely looks a bit suspicious, doesn't it? <laughs> it's very suspicious, yeah, definitely. <laughs> on the other side of the trench, Jack has been working away on another burial. I've got more than one bone now, because I've got one down here, but I've also got another couple up here. And although the, it's in awful condition, but it does suggest that it might be articulated, but it's right on the surface. I can't see a cut, a feature that it, it relates to at all. It's right on that subsoil. But interestingly, it's not the same alignment of that grave that we found there or where you are over there. Mm. But still, possibly three graves. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think we have... It is now starting to look more like a cemetery than just singletons, just one-off burials. In Trench 3, attempts to get down into the ditch that Matt found earlier are being hampered by the solid ground. But a sudden rainstorm has come to our aid. Here they come. Here they come. How many people can you get under on, one guys. camping set? There are three absolute pros over there still digging away in the rain. Change in the colour in the trousers. <laughs> one side <laughs> on, the other side on. 
Taking refuge in the dome, Helen's begun the lengthy process of cleaning the buckle that was found yesterday in Trench 2. And, and would this have been a, for a belt or for...? I, it's some kind of strap, but they're normally found at the waist, so it's thought of as a, as, a, as a belt fitting. But because these are found almost always with men, there is sometimes a hint that it may have been some kind of sword belt. And what I'm hoping is that there's going to be some kind of decoration underneath here. And these can range from appliqued separate components, you know, like sometimes there's one amazing one where there's a little model of a fish, um, uh, to, to just stamp decoration or all sorts of things. What, what we're seeing here is the tops of two rivets. This one looks like it's got a, a decorative boss covering it. Mm -hmm. This one looks like it's lost that boss. You can almost see the, 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 the shaft of the rivet. And then there's a third one um, on the bottom here. We've actually got to the point where I'd quite like to see this under a microscope rather than just doing it with the naked Sorry. eye. So um, bring it into focus. Ooh. It's wonderful to watch it. There, lovely. Now. If I point with my little thorn, can you see the, there's a straight edge along there? Yes. And that is the, the hinge that's joining this um, cast frame to this sheet plate. Is that the hinge? I want to focus. Well, this is the end of the stra of the strap of the oh, the end of the under plate. So you've got to imagine the strap coming up. Under, between where I'm poking. Yeah. So if there was any straps surviving, this is where it would be coming, uh, this is where it be, would be. Now what we don't understand is what's between these two sandwiches, um, these two pieces of bread, so to speak, what is the filling in that sandwich? That Why have we got two layers? That's not normal. At this point, I left Helen to go visit the test pits, leaving the cameras to keep recording. We're just getting one of those odd time team effects now where you carry on doing something when you'd normally stop because somebody's filming you and they just need a few more minutes of film. And I had thought I'd got as far as I could with this and I'm just gently, gently, gently brushing and tiny, tiny bits of soil are coming off imperceptibly virtually and they're revealing more detail and I think I've got something I completely hadn't spotted before, which is a possible, possible repair. And a lot more decoration is coming out. But it's just about visible there. After the dig, X-ray revealed more detail of what appears to be a, a highly decorated buckle. It tells us at least one man was buried in a richly furnished grave few decades before Our Lady. It's one for the Virtual Museum, as it shows that she wasn't just popped into a cemetery of ordinary people. And now the rainstorm has brought out the colours in Trench too. Francis and Romy think that they can see more possible graves. There's a bit of bone coming through here, yeah. just the leg. And I've got a tiny right fragment. There. I think I might have a strip of orange that's not quite orange, which that bit of bone lies on top of. And, what, and, and that's what I think I have here. It's similar. It's very brown, rather than this being orange. I think. I think we might have two down. more graves. I think we do have two more graves. Yeah, definitely. So I, I think I've got one here as well, by the way. So that's one, two, three, four, five, six, six graves, graves in total. Yeah. One is not on the same alignment. But yeah, six graves. I'd call that a cemetery. Me too. Any grave goods from this cemetery have probably been spread across the field by the plough, which tallies with the location of the finds that Tom has discovered over the years. And then you've got these nail cleaners, aren't they? Which are classic Romano-British gear for keeping clean. He also found a lot of Roman coins and artefacts in the field to the north of the burials, which he thought might be the remains of a villa. So we're wondering what connection it might have to our Anglo-Saxon story. Oh yes, there, these are bigger bits. There's, that's definitely, or is that a field drain? Is that tegula or field drain? I think that's in bricks. But although there's evidence of a building, there doesn't seem to be enough to suggest it's a villa. I'm not convinced. I'm really not convinced of anything, you know. 
Me no, neither. Me the neither. just isn't enough, is there? I mean, I've field war Roman sites that use in masses of stuff, you know what it's like. Yeah, you'd be move. tripping over it, wouldn't yeah, you? absolutely, yeah. The Romans really did like their stuff. So. Yes. Yeah. And this is all local as well. It's, it's very small scale. But the one yeah. thing we do need to think about is the huge number of coins that have been found in this field. Like, I think it's about 100, 120. That is and a lot. they are focused on the springs over there. I mean, it might be worth investigating around the spring. Has it been geophysed around the spring, Jan? Don't know yet. I think we really do need a geophysed plot to help us, just to have a look. So geophysed set to work to see if there's any evidence of buildings around the spring. Interestingly, Stuart's investigations have led him up the stream to exactly the same field. This gap in the hedge saved me a long walk round. In fact, we're just on the slope above the stream, coming from the field with a burial in it. Come through this hedge and try not to leave too much of myself behind. And out we come into the field where all the the Roman building material has been found. Kind of a bit of a, a journey along the stream really from Shelfanger right up to the north head of the valley. The further north I've come, the narrower it gets, the more enclosed it gets. That's been a bit of a trip. I'm ready for a bit of a sit down and a rest under a tree. A bit of thinking time now. A Roman spring and a shrine might explain why this site would have been a suitable burial ground for Anglo-Saxon aristocracy. But do Tom's Roman finds support this theory? Where does it start? Well, it starts with this late Iron Age material here on the cusp of the Roman period. We've got a Nauheim derivative brooch or a fragment of one. Here. Oh, that's one of those one piece ones. Yeah, that with the coils at the top, all yeah. made in one piece. Like Almost like a safety pin. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And even a little Iron Age coin here, I think it's a copy, and then would have been the core of a, oh, yes. a gold, gold, yeah, gold yeah. coin. And then moving on into the first, second century, we've got lots of objects of personal adornment, like bits of brooches, mm -hmm. um, some of these lovely classic Romano British um, nail cleaners. Which oh, yes, yes, hoiking out the dirt. Form yes. part of those little cosmetic mm -hmm. sets with tweezers and those ear scoops. And we've got this really exciting assemblage of late second, early third century material. And it's really exciting because it gives us some insight into the identities of the people living or coming to the site at that time. There's part of a little um, military belt plate here that would have formed part of a sword belt of a soldier. Right. And then also we've got several bits of harness fittings. We've got a pendant here and some studs. And in the mid-Roman period, it would only really be soldiers who'd have access to horses. They'd be quite an expensive accoutrement. So that's the Roman army. But what are they doing here? Because this is just the middle of nowhere in the Roman period, isn't it? But you have to think of the Roman army as being mobilised throughout the landscape. And we've got probably soldiers coming here, keeping check on the local population. And moving on to the coins, we've got this massive explosion of coins from the late third century all the way through to the end of the Roman period. Now, you kind of have to expect that on any Romano-British site of the late Roman period. But what's really interesting is the number of coins that we've got in this late third century period, 275 to 285. That's a little bit unusual. Usually, if you have that number of coins, you'd be it would be an urban profile, and we definitely don't have a city out there. And can you shed any light on this, Rachel? Well, we do have these two things here. OK. Which are coin blanks. And we know that during this period, there is a lot of coin copying going on in Roman Britain. Yes, to create more to create more, change. Yeah. yeah. It's possible somebody is minting counterfeit coinage on the site, perhaps for deposition in a votive deposit, maybe, who knows. There's also a possibility that there's a small hoard or purse drop concealed amongst these coins. Because we've got quite a lot of coins of the Emperor Carousius. There are five or six issues, and they're all quite well preserved. So they've not been knocking around as much in the plough soil, perhaps. So what's, what's happening in the fourth century? Well, there are certainly more coins, not quite as many as there are in the late third century. But you can see they run all the way through to 402. Mm -hmm. We've also got some fragments of bracelets and this really nice finger ring 
which is made of tin. It looks like it's made of silver, but it's yeah. actually tin, as mm. we found out from XRF. They tend to be dedicated to the gods. So that might give some support to the idea of votive deposition on the side. So now you've looked at all of it, Philippa, what's your thought about what it all means? So what I've really noticed is that these are the sorts of things that you do tend to get offered in votive deposits. So these are oh. things with personal meaning to people and they offer them to gods as part of their personal relationship with the gods. And do you think that's, that's matched with the pottery and the building material, Rachel? Well, not quite as elaborate. The pottery is much more domestic in nature. Mm -hmm. We've got the coarse grey wares that will be for food storage, food preparation, cooking, eating. A couple of colour-coated pieces are probably drinking vessels or flagons to hold the liquids. But my eye is completely caught by these because that to me looks like it's the keying for plaster that's put on a box flue yes. tile implying central heating up the walls. Indeed, we even have a corner fragment of one of the box flue tile yes. blocks again with the combed keying for the, the plaster. So we've got a centrally heated building. We have, we have a ceramic roof as well, Tegula and Imbrex roof tiles and two sorts of Roman brick. So we've got a building, a centrally heated building with a tile roof, maybe a tile floor, uh, and in the same field, we've got a votive site that's attracting offerings. Yes, yes that sounds like it could be the case, yeah. So it's an intriguing theory, which could help explain why this site was chosen for our wind-farthing woman's final resting place. John, meanwhile, has had a revelation about where her grave might actually be. Everybody has said, the yes, burial was south of the ditch. Because that was what was on the plot from the original geophysics. But, but it didn't my, match the grid reference. No, and your grid reference that you've given us Matches is that. exactly there, right. north of the ditch. Okay. So the point is, when the trench was being dug, nobody would know it was south of the ditch because you didn't know where the ditch was in the field. No, that is entirely a good point. Yeah, we had absolutely no idea. No idea no, where that no. was. Now we've got a GPS point that coincides with the plan. We, we've got to look at it. That does sound very tempting. OK then, John, this is it. <laughs> <laughs> For the fourth time. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure. So Mad extends Trench 3 to test John's theory but also on the lookout for other burials or a ring ditch. I mean, it's definitely... That's clean, 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 isn't it, there? Clean, natural. Well, there's nothing obvious. No. But... How can you lose a burial? <laughs> he did say it wasn't going to be easy. Back in the church in Windfarthing, Paul Blinkhorn has been sifting through the files that have been coming in from the test pits. Hi, Paul. How's it going? I, uh, uh, it's getting interesting. Um, we're down to about context four now, and we're starting to get some really interesting stuff. I don't know if you saw these yesterday, but a couple of nice bits of late Saxon pottery. The rims from uh, Thetford were jars. Uh, you'll be unsurprised now it's made in Thetford, uh, probably in about the 10th or 11th century. I mean. Quite often in this part of the world, the villages come to uh, come into being around about the 10th century, and so that's kind of a good marker right. for you know early part of the village. It was in the topsoil, but nevertheless, it's with the thumbs sort or of thing. So that's and, good. Yeah. What but, else have we got? Uh, we're getting started again. Not lots of nice bits of uh, medieval now as well. Another bit of late Saxon from another one of the pits, another oh. bit of Thetford work. Excellent. So we've got two different test pits producing late Saxon work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're getting bits of early medieval now. Nice. There's two little bits of the standard early medieval, 11th, 12th century. Yeah. And my favourite find so far, it's a 13th, 14th century jug rim. And you can see where the potter's made a lip with his finger or her finger, yeah. I love that. It's brilliant when you get that with pottery, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it, it brings it to life. That was probably made at Eddingham down in Essex. It, you find it all over East Anglia from about the late 12th century onwards. Okay. It's looking very much, even in these early days, that we're looking at a, a late Saxon, post-Viking village. I mean, 
there was a complete reorganisation of the landscape after the Vikings went through. Mm-hmm. And a lot of new settlements sprung up. And if you imagine Wild West cavalry forts <laughs> with a village around them and a church, that was the kind of thing. And it's starting to look like wind farthing was possibly one of those, mm-hmm. but it's very early. I'm not doing that with three shirts of pottery. <laughs> Even I won't do that with three shirts of pottery. <laughs> The hope is that these test pits mark the start of a longer-term project in Windfarthing. And, and have you taken to it? Is it something oh, you'd like? Oh, it's exciting, yes. I mean, as I was saying to, to Danny, when I weed my garden next time, it'll just take hours because <laughs> I should be sifting through everything to see what's, see what's in there. Yeah. And the sense of community that I've yeah, yeah. Well, I've this really is, this is my yeah. new best friend. We met this morning, but when you're pot washing together... Yeah. We'd have to turn the hose on, which was the yes, start on it. Yes, that's true, covered everyone in it. But, <laughs> no, it's... Uh, yeah, it is. It is, as you see, local people, when you just... Just to strike up conversations. Yeah. But when time team leave, do you think you know oh, archaeology yes. and this sense of community oh, will that be something that'll be left behind? I think so, yeah. Yesterday, Derek and Lawrence spotted some masonry in the medieval church wall, which they thought could have come from something earlier. Thanks to Adam's photogrammetry, we've been doing some three D modelling of it. And um, we've been trying to pull out some of the details, but there are linear, there are features on there, there are yeah. engravings on there. Doesn't it look like part of a cross It shaft? does, exactly like that. Uh, I, it's nice to hear you guys saying that, because this is what we thought. We, and, and Derek, well, spot, I must say, Derek spotted this, and he's, he's, yeah. he's wow. done amazingly well here. Yeah. Something like Undoubtedly, that. I mean, that's certainly man-made, but very, very weathered, of course, mm-hmm. which is what you would expect of a much older Anglo-Saxon standing cross, very characteristic of the 7th and 8th centuries, mm-hmm. and which, of course, over time would weather, and the wind and the and various vicissitudes, the Danes marauding the countryside, yeah. they tend to fall over, and so when it comes to building a church, the medieval masons would be recycling any rubble stone <laughs> that comes to hand, especially near, if it's nearby. Mm-hmm. But other than that, I, as I say, we got a bit distracted by this. So, <laughs> I, so I, I can't add it. too much more landscape stories, I'm afraid. But Stuart, hopefully you can... Uh, you can <laughs> well, I hope so. This. My wind father is, is the, the yeah. whole... The whole yeah. Yeah, that, that's what's really been, been challenging me. And, um, valleys yes penetrating into the center of the hundred yeah and this one particular one coming That's round here yeah. is where we've got our lovely uh, you've got this shoulder sticking out it's the perfect place to place a burial mm-hmm. in this special place as you come to this wooded alcove in the landscape but if we look up what that also might be pointing to Shrine. I've used yeah. the word shrine quite carefully here, but is that the sort of place you might get for a hundred meeting yeah. place? Yes, it takes all the boxes for that. Uh, a, a holy well, perhaps a holy beck, holy stream, and, and, and a natural amphitheatre structure, which would of course lend it to the kind of soundscape you want for a, an open air meeting place. So it's just possible that the central meeting place could have been in the field just next door to our Anglo-Saxon cemetery. I wonder if it's worthwhile getting the metal detector just to flick over this and see what we can see. John? In Trench 2, Jackie's hoping that some of the burials that we're uncovering might have grave goods that could help us to characterise the cemetery. So, the cut goes up to there, but also it comes right the way down to here. I'm going to get out of the way because I've yeah. got steel toe cut boots on, so I don't want you picking. Mm. Yeah, there's a positive signal, but it's it's definitely an iron signal. Right. It's quite long and thin. So right. I'm thinking you've got something that sort of. Yeah, because the bit, the way you got that high pitch peak was there. That's that's. With, I think that might be the femur there, or yeah, one of the just things. Just there. So it's almost like this level, you know, sort of thigh, waist thigh yeah. level. It's small, but it could also be being masked by the irons. While you're here, do you think you can have a look at this where Romy was? So you can kind of stand in there, but you can see there's a bright orange there and a bright orange there, and a slightly yep. dirtier orange in the middle, and that's, that's the grey. So okay, you can so stand across there. Can stand yeah, there. you can stand there. Yeah. It's quite long. Oh, that sounds yeah. quite okay. high pitched. We've got a, non, a non-ferrous, high pitched 
Oh, wow. That, just that there. sounds quite interesting. That sounds to me, Romy, like you're going to have a really interesting day tomorrow. I can't wait. That, Jolly that's good. of interest, but that's a particular interest because it's not... But you have to do the whole thing, not just that bit. Okay. Yeah, I'll bring my best dig in. Right. <laughs> <laughs> OK, right. Thanks, okay. John. Good Brilliant. Luck. These burials have suffered so much plough damage that any grave goods surviving where they were buried would be incredibly valuable to our story. By the end of day two, we've opened up two big trenches to look for our wind-farthing woman. The absence of any archaeology in trench one and three suggests that Our Lady was deliberately set apart from the other graves we're finding in trench two. This might be a cemetery and there might be... It's definitely a cemetery, absolutely definitely, but it might be quite a dense cemetery, which is really not what I was expecting, which is, a, which is really nice. It's really nice to know that, that the Windfarthing lady was, was in the middle of a, of a, of a folk cemetery, of, her, of, of people that were around her. And, and, and it's not just this trench. Obviously, we've got more to do further up the hill, uh, but the, there's the hints of more coming out there too. And in the northern field, we've got evidence of a structure both from the finds and beginning to come up I think from the geophysics so so it's it is all still quite tentative and I'm very aware that we've only got one day left but I don't think it's all been blitzed into nothingness by the plough so one day left come on let's go and get in the wall yes please Tomorrow, we'll expand our investigation into the field next door to see if there is a Roman shrine here before Our Lady was interred. And her burial has inspired Sam to perform for us as the sun sets on day two. We've been spending a lot of time looking at the, the landscape and the forgotten features of this landscape, give us the setting of this wonderful burial. But there's another aspect to it that is often overlooked, that is the forgotten soundscape what the sounds that were heard, an obituary she would have had. The, the traditional meaning for most ordinary people and for years after would be the poetry. And so looking at the old language and some of the words they would have used to describe the lady herself and indeed that beautiful uh, pendant, um, I, I started listing a few things and then I thought, why don't I sort of string them together, try and simulate something of the old English verse that would have been heard in this landscape at the time. What? With Worthing, Worthinger Londers, Eders Adalu, Alf Wies, Freyo for Yipton in Winners for Yothinger, Thousandum Wintrum, and Freyo Hundum. No thine banners slappinger, in Bedignes be Becker, Clafty a good. Ring Roden. Bis art unreon from earth grappa, seo crafty, sonas lockingers. Who brooketh we, thy unbreost sigaland, sero yimmers, cinch in golda, yachen stanas, athol cunas, er ye watch. Wonders with us. Cunning wife, draw crafty, elf shiny latcher, eat as hallig. May thou wendon, mid windum fario, to thara huda on hyovenum. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses and behind the scenes insights.